Hi, I'm Billy Gwaltney, and this is the CYA Podcast. This show is for the physician who understands the importance of protecting everything you've worked so hard to achieve. Each week, I'll bring you tips and advice to help you cut through the clutter and misinformation and show you exactly what you need to preserve your income and way of life. If you're ready to achieve the peace of mind that only financial security can bring, let's get started. Welcome to this episode of the Cover Your Assets podcast. This is your host, Billy Gwaltney, and as always, I'm thankful to be with you and excited to be with you. Today's topic, we're going to answer the question of how is my maximum private disability benefit calculated once I become an attending? That's an excellent question. I work with physicians all over the country, the vast majority of whom are, are in training when we start working with them and they secure their private specialty disability coverage. And then when they graduate, they're interested in increasing coverage to keep pace with the significantly higher, hopefully a significantly higher uh, attending salary. So this question comes up, uh, how is that calculated? The other question that comes up is what is the process? That's going to be a separate podcast. It is a little bit different right now. So you'll, you'll see another episode for that. Right now, I just want to concentrate on how is it determined what the amount is that I can increase, okay? Now, in working, like I said, with physicians across the country, we strive to allow their coverage to have the ability to increase coverage through what's called a future increase option or future purchase option, benefit increase rider, benefit update. Different companies call it different things. The importance of having that rider on a policy, it is a rider, that goes on the policy allows you to increase coverage as your income goes up without having to redo any medical screening. That's the first key element. The second component is that it includes the trainee discount, whatever trainee discount is on your base or original policy, then the increased amounts would include that, would include that discount as well. And those are important features to have. Now, some of our clients are not able to get the increase rider where they can automatically just flip a switch and increase coverage There are times because of medical history where they can get the initial coverage, but they may have to just update the medical screening to be sure things are stable when they go to increase. So either way, whether you have a rider on your policy or whether you don't, when you become an attending, there is a formula that companies use to calculate how much coverage you can buy. And that formula is the same regardless of whether or not you have the rider or don't have the rider. Okay. What's important to know is that if an insurance company will allow a physician to purchase, say, $20,000 a month of private coverage or even $30,000 a month of private coverage, they won't allow somebody to have that amount just because they're willing to pay for it. It might be a common assumption that, hey, if an insurance company can get somebody to pay a higher premium, then they'll do whatever it takes to make that happen. That's not true. Yes, insurance companies want to make profit. Yes, that is true. But what they fear more than they desire that profit is what's called over-insuring someone where they have too much of an incentive to become disabled. Believe it or not, that that is true. Insurance companies really, really don't want people having too much insurance so that they get creative about how to become disabled or and or there's no motivation for them to rehabilitate and come back to work once they're on claim. So insurance companies really try to limit you know, they want it to be adequate based on that income, but they don't want it to be too much. An insurance company will never let someone get rich off of an insurance claim. They just won't. Now, what's important is that this is the only time that they can make that calculation applicable to the policy. Okay. Once this additional coverage amount is issued. Okay. And I want to mention this, but in case I forget it later, once that amount is issued, they can never take it away. Okay. So if you have a certain amount of income and they offer you this increased in coverage, increased amount, and you take them up on that and you're paying that higher premium, let's say that a year or two or a few years down the road, you go work, go to work part time and your income goes down a lot. Okay. Maybe it's cut by half or a third or whatever it is. As long as you pay the premium for that higher insurance amount, they have to cover you for that higher amount. Okay. They can never reduce it at that point just because you're making less money. They also cannot offset or or reduce any benefit at claim because you're making less money. If it's structured properly with, with our clients, we work with the top, there are only four top tier specialty disability contracts as of the time of this podcast recording. I'm only talking about these four contracts. Once that amount of additional coverage is issued, that's the amount. If you're disabled at a period when your income is lower, 
because of a decision you made or just the economy or COVID or whatever it is, whatever uh, the next pandemic is and it impacts income or whatever, they still have to pay you that higher benefit amount. They cannot reduce it because your income would not have supported it. So the only time that they can run these numbers or make this formula a part of, of your coverage is when you go to increase. Okay. That's the only time they can do it. All right. So once you become an attending, there are two things that these insurance companies look at in order to determine how much coverage you can increase. All right. The first one is your new salary, pre-tax guaranteed income. That's the first thing they look at. If you have a bonus, they will, the only way the bonus can be counted is if either a, the bonus, the, a part of the bonus is guaranteed. So it's technically not a bonus, but they pay it as a bonus. They would typically give you credit for that. But otherwise, the bonus can only be counted towards additional coverage once it's earned. Okay. The guaranteed part, they can give you credit for that right when you go to increase coverage as you start the new job. Okay. So let me back up just a minute. Once you're within 90 days of graduation from training, fellowship or, or residency, training for good, and you have a signed employment contract, at that point, you're eligible to increase coverage, okay? Some of our clients do it as soon as that 90-day window gets there. Once, say, April comes and they're assuming they're graduating at the end of June, when April comes, they want to increase coverage because they have a signed employment contract. They may not start that job till August or September, but they don't care. They want a higher coverage amount as soon as an insurance company will let them have it. The rate goes up, okay? The, the premium's higher for that, of course, but a lot, of, a lot of our clients want to go ahead and activate that. So you can be covered for a higher insurance amount, even though you're not earning that income technically yet. Okay, Or you can wait until you graduate or wait until you start the new job. The choice is yours. But once that 90-day window kicks in, one company has a 180-day window. Is that, that's, one company goes to that extreme. Um, but generally, it's 90 days and beyond uh, you can increase your coverage. So that's when the the calculation becomes important. The first part of the calculation is guaranteed income, contractual salary, okay? Production bonuses, incentives, all those things are usually counted once they're earned into the future, okay? They won't give you credit for that now unless there's like a minimum amount of the guarantee that they'll, that they promise you. They'll say, you know, your bonus is guaranteed to be at least, you know, 10,000 per quarter or 20,000 a year, whatever it is. They'll generally give you credit for that guaranteed bonus part. If you're a 1099 independent contractor or self-employed, usually we're going to need three to six months of pay stubs before an insurance company will be able to give you credit for that new income. Okay. It's just going to take some time. They, the days of just allowing an anesthesiologist to be credited for a certain amount of income as an attending, those days are gone. And a lot of it's because of production driven pay. And so if you are self-employed, if you are an independent contractor, if the person paying you that independent contract can, you know, as far, if they'll go as far as to say our average salary for someone in your spot is 300000 or 400000 whatever it is, and sometimes an underwriter will give you credit for some or all of that, okay? But I will say, as of the time of this podcast, insurance underwriters are getting more restrictive with physician compensation because they, they have so much riding on one physician becoming disabled. Again, once they issue that ten thousand or fifteen thousand or twenty thousand or thirty thousand benefit, that's that's they're on the hook for that benefit potentially for thirty years, and so the only time they can make sure that they're not making an unwise decision is is at the time you're increasing it. They want to know what that income is. So the more you can get, if you're in a variable compensation structure, the more you can get that employer to drill down and cite what they expect to be a guaranteed or average or typical salary for someone in your place, the more chance you have of an underwriter giving you credit for that. Okay. Otherwise, you'll need to wait until you have three to six months of receipts or, or pay stubs in order for that income to count. First key is the income. The second part of the formula is any group long-term disability coverage that you are given through an employer. Long-term disability. This is not short-term disability, just long-term disability. There are two aspects of that. One is the percentage of income covered. And the second part is the maximum monthly benefit cap. Okay. So it's always going to be expressed as say 60% of your income to a cap of 10,000 per month or to a cap of 20,000 per month. Whatever that cap is, the underwriter is going to want to know what that cap is. 
if it's employer paid and you have to accept it, most of our client, obviously you, you need to take it. But this amount of group long-term disability, there are two issues with it. Number one, it counts against how much private coverage you can buy. And two, it's much less valuable at time of claim. Okay, I've done other podcasts. If you're a client of mine, we've probably talked about this. If you're going through this exercise as a new attending, we will talk about this. It's just important to understand the quality of the private specialty coverage, compare, again, properly designed compared to group long-term disability. It's just like night and day. Again, I've covered that in other podcasts, but it's hard for me not to at least mention that adverse selection kicks in for employer policies because insurance companies have to cover everybody regardless of their health. And adverse selection is something insurance companies do their best to avoid. And they just they they avoid it by watering down the definitions and making it more difficult for anyone to collect. And so at time of claim, you're going to want as much private coverage as you can get your hands on. Yes, it's more expensive. I'm saying this not just because I'm an insurance broker. I would say this regardless of who the broker is. Make sure you have a maximum amount of private coverage. Now, what I'm going to do now is give you an example of a salary level without group LTD and with group LTD to give you an idea of the difference in how much private coverage you can have. Okay, so I jotted down a couple of things. So if you have a, a new attending salary of, say, 400000 per year pre-tax, okay, that would allow you, and you have no group LTD through your employer, okay, 400000 no group LTD, you're going to be eligible for about 16000 maybe 16500 per month of private specialty disability coverage. Keep in mind that private specialty coverage is non-taxed or post-tax, whatever you want to call it. You do not pay state or federal income tax on that benefit. You do pay state or federal income tax on your pre-tax salary, right? So it looks a little weird at first to kind of go, well, if I'm making 400, why am I only getting 16 a month of private? Well, you got to gross up the 16 or 16.5, depending on the company, to get to the pre-tax equivalent of what that would be. And you'll find that on average, you're going to be between 70 and 80% of your net pay. Okay. That's about as close as an insurance company will want you to be, uh, if they can help it, <laughs> to your replacement value, your replacement income. They'll allow you to get between 70 and 80% of your net post-tax income. They'll allow you to have from, from a disability benefit. So, 400,000 no group LTD can let you get a private specialty benefit of 16 or 16.5, depending on the company. Okay. Let's say that you make the same 400,000 and now, but now you're, you're with an employer that has a group LTD benefit of 60% of your salary up to a cap of 20,000 per month employer paid. Okay. That's going to reduce your private specialty disability benefit by half. Okay. You're now only going to be eligible for about eight thousand a month of total private specialty coverage. So you have the same income, both scenarios, physician A, physician B, both are making four hundred thousand per year. One can have a private specialty benefit of sixteen thousand or a little bit more, sixteen thousand five hundred. The other one, because they have a group LTD cap of twenty thousand per month, can only have eight thousand per month. That's a big difference. And the difference is, unfortunately, is that time of claim, the winner is very likely to be the 400,000 without any group LTD. They're going to get a much higher private specialty disability benefit, non-taxed. They, if the illness or injury prevents them from doing their specific duties, they, they know they're going to get that benefit. Whereas the other one, on paper, it looks nice to work for an employer because they're going to brag about having a 60% of salary replacement to a cap of 20,000 per month. That's a big benefit. That's exciting. That's why you want to work with us. That's what they're going to promote. But at time of claim, there's a really good chance that benefit's not going to pay. Or if it does pay, it'll pay for a short period of time and then kick you out because of social security benefits or other things. It's just much more difficult to collect. Okay. I've seen this happen time and time again. We have clients on claim, unfortunately, they get paid their private disability benefit. A lot of times they never see anything, not a single nickel from their employer policy. Okay. So it's, like I said earlier, it's like night and day, but whether or not, even though it's less valuable, if you have it, it still factors into how much private coverage you can get. Now, that's once you start that job. 
as your career expands and as your career grows and your income, those production bonuses are earned and they kick in, then we can revisit the formula to increase coverage further. And or if you are making the same income or you're making more income and you transition to an employer that did have group LTD and now the new one doesn't, or you you become an independent contractor or any of those other things happen, now we can go back and redo the calculation to see if additional coverage is available. And that's the importance of keeping in mind that there is the ability through the future purchase options and through the benefit increase riders to increase your coverage as your income goes up. There is a formula for it. The devil is in the details. I say that all the time. Uh, it's true here. Make sure you're working with a specialist that we're in touch with our clients on a regular basis to make sure that it's where they want it to be. Again, this has nothing to do, whoever your broker is, just make sure that they're proactive in reaching out to you because expenses go up during a claim. You're going to want the maximum benefit that you can qualify for. Like I say, uh, the only complaint we've ever gotten from a client on, com- on, on claim, they all get paid. The only complaint is I should have had the maximum. I should have listened. I should have gotten the maximum. And because their expenses go up and we had one client where they didn't have the maximum amount. The uh, funny thing is they came back to work. They fully recovered because they were healthy before it started. It, it contributed to them bouncing back really quick within a couple of years, which which isn't really quick, but quick comparatively for the condition they had. And when they came back, their their income was able to increase because they came back at, in the right place at the right time when their specialty was in high demand. And as soon as that happened, they increased their coverage right away because they could still do it through their private coverage, even though they had been out on claim previously. It's really important. Also, one final thing, in considering the amount of coverage to increase to once you become an attending, keep in mind that once a claim is filed, you cannot increase your coverage. Uh, you cannot then say, hey, I want the maximum now that I'm disabled because I realize I need it. You can't do that. You can only increase it before a claim occurs, before an illness occurs or an injury occurs. There is more to this, uh, depending on the details of your situation. There are always exceptions. I would be happy to discuss your situation if you would like. Feel free to text me to arrange a conversation, 704-270-2376. Again, 704-270-2376. Again, it's Billy Gwaltney. And until we meet again, thank you as always for your time. See you soon. This is the podcastfactory.com.